Chapter 13 of My Bondage and My Freedom by Frederick Douglass, narrated by Gregicator. The Vicissitudes of Slave Life. List of chapter topics. Death of Old Master's son, Richard, speedily followed by that of Old Master. Valuation and division of all the property, including the slaves. My presence required at Hillsboro to be appraised and allotted to a new owner, my sad prospects and grief, parting, the utter powerlessness of the slaves to decide their own destiny, a general dread of Master Andrew, his wickedness and cruelty, Miss Lucretia, my new owner, my return to Baltimore, joy under the roof of Master Hugh, Death of Mrs. Lucretia, my poor old grandmother, her sad fate, the lone cot in the woods, Master Thomas Ald's second marriage, again removed from Master Hughes, reasons for regretting the change, a plan of escape entertained. I must now ask the reader to go with me a little back in point of time, in my humble story, and to notice another circumstance that entered into my slavery experience, and which doubtless has had a share in deepening my horror of slavery and increasing my hostility toward those men and measures that practically uphold the slave system. It has already been observed that, though I was, after my removal from Colonel Lloyd's plantation, in form the slave of Master Hugh, I was, in fact, and in law, the slave of my old master, Captain Anthony. Very well. In a very short time after I went to Baltimore, my old master's youngest son, Richard, died, and in three years and six months after his death, my old master himself died, leaving only his son, Andrew, and his daughter, Lucretia, to share his estate. The old man died while on a visit to his daughter in Hillsboro, where Captain Ald and Mrs. Lucretia now lived. The former, having given up the command of Colonel Lloyd's sloop, was now keeping a store in that town. Cut off thus unexpectedly, Captain Anthony died in testate, and his property must now be equally divided between his two children, Andrew and Lucretia. The valuation and the division of slaves among contending heirs is an important incident in slave life. The character and tendencies of the heirs are generally well understood among the slaves who are to be divided, and all have their aversions and preferences, but neither their aversions nor their preferences avail them anything. On the death of Old Master, I was immediately sent for to be valued and divided with the other property. Personally, my concern was mainly about my possible removal from the home of Master Hugh, which, after that of my grandmother, was the most endeared to me. But the whole thing, as a feature of slavery, shocked me. It furnished me a new insight into the unnatural power to which I was subjected. My detestation of slavery, already great, rose with this new conception of its enormity. That was a sad day for me, a sad day for little Tommy, and a sad day for my dear Baltimore mistress and teacher when I left for the eastern shore to be valued and divided. We all three wept bitterly that day, for we might be parting, and we feared we were parting forever. No one could tell among which pile of chattels I should be flung. Thus early, I got a foretaste of that painful uncertainty which slavery brings to the ordinary lot of mortals. Sickness, adversity, and death may interfere with the plans and purposes of all, but the slave has the added danger of changing homes, changing hands, and of having separations unknown to other men. Then, too, there was the intensified degradation of the spectacle. What an assemblage! Men and women, young and old, married and single, moral and intellectual beings, in open contempt of their humanity, 
leveled at a blow with horses, sheep, horned cattle, and swine, horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank in the scale of social existence, and all subjected to the same narrow inspection to ascertain their value in gold and silver, the only standard of worth applied by slaveholders to slaves. How vividly at that moment did the brutalizing power of slavery flash before me, personality swallowed up in the sordid idea of property, manhood lost in chattelhood. After the valuation, then came the division. This was an hour of high excitement and distressing anxiety. Our destiny was now to be fixed for life, and we had no more voice in the decision of the question than the oxen and cows that stood chewing at the haymow. One word from the appraisers, against all preferences or prayers, was enough to sunder all the ties of friendship and affection, and even to separate husbands and wives, parents and children. We were all appalled before that power, which, to human seeming, could bless or blast us in a moment. Added to the dread of separation, most painful to the majority of the slaves, we all had a decided horror of the thought of falling into the hands of Master Andrew. He was distinguished for cruelty and intemperance. Slaves generally dread to fall into the hands of drunken owners. Master Andrew was almost a confirmed sot, and had already, by his reckless mismanagement and profligate dissipation, wasted a large portion of old master's property. To fall into his hands was therefore considered merely as the first step toward being sold away to the far south. He would spend his fortune in a few years, and his farms and slaves would be sold, we thought, at public outcry, and we should be hurried away to the cotton fields and rice swamps of the sunny south. This was the cause of deep consternation. The people of the north, and free people generally, I think, have less attachment to the places where they are born and brought up than have the slaves. Their freedom to go and come, to be here and there as they list, prevents any extravagant attachment to any one particular place in their case. On the other hand, the slave is a fixture. He has no choice, no goal, no destination, but is pegged down to a single spot and must take root here or nowhere. The idea of removal elsewhere comes generally in the shape of a threat and in punishment of crime. It is therefore attended with fear and dread. A slave seldom thinks of bettering his condition by being sold, and hence he looks upon separation from his native place with none of the enthusiasm which animates the bosoms of young freemen when they contemplate a life in the far west or in some distant country where they intend to rise to wealth and distinction. Nor can those from whom they separate give them up with that cheerfulness with which friends and relations yield each other up when they feel that it is for the good of the departing one that he is removed from his native place. Then, too, there is correspondence, and there is at least the hope of reunion, because reunion is possible. But with the slave, all these mitigating circumstances are wanting. There is no improvement in his condition probable, no correspondence possible, no reunion attainable. His going out into the world is like a living man going into the tomb, who, with open eyes, sees himself buried out of sight and hearing of wife, children, and friends of kindred tie. In contemplating the likelihoods and possibilities of our circumstances, I probably suffered more than most of my fellow servants. I had known what it was to experience kind and even tender treatment. They had known nothing of the sort. Life to them had been rough and thorny as well as dark. They had, most of them, lived on my old master's farm in Tuckahoe and had felt the reign of Mr. Plummer's rule. The overseer had written his character on the living parchment of most of their backs, 
and left them callous. My back, thanks to my early removal from the plantation to Baltimore, was yet tender. I had left a kind mistress at Baltimore, who was almost a mother to me. She was in tears when we parted, and the probabilities of ever seeing her again, trembling in the balance as they did, could not be viewed without alarm and agony. The thought of leaving that kind mistress forever, and worse still, of being the slave of Andrew Anthony, a man who, but a few days before the division of the property, had, in my presence, seized my brother Perry by the throat, dashed him on the ground, and with the heel of his boot stamped him on the head until the blood gushed from his nose and ears, was terrible. This fiendish proceeding had no better apology than the fact that Perry had gone to play when Master Andrew wanted him for some trifling service. This cruelty, too, was of a piece with his general character. After inflicting his heavy blows on my brother, on observing me looking at him with intense astonishment, he said, That is the way I will serve you one of these days, meaning, no doubt, when I should come into his possession. This threat, the reader may well suppose, was not very tranquilizing to my feelings. I could see that he really thirsted to get hold of me, but I was there only for a few days. I had not received any orders, and had violated none, and there was, therefore, no excuse for flogging me. At last, the anxiety and suspense were ended, and they ended, thanks to a kind providence, in accordance with my wishes. I fell to the portion of Mrs. Lucretia, the dear lady who bound up my head when the savage Aunt Katie was adding to my sufferings her bitterest maledictions. Captain Thomas Ald and Mrs. Lucretia at once decided on my return to Baltimore. They knew how sincerely and warmly Mrs. Hugh Ald was attached to me, and how delighted Mr. Hugh's son would be to have me back. And, withal, having no immediate use for one so young, they willingly let me off to Baltimore. I need not stop here to narrate my joy on returning to Baltimore, nor that of little Tommy, nor the tearful joy of his mother, nor the evident satisfaction of Master Hugh. I was just one month absent from Baltimore before the matter was decided, and the time really seemed full six months. One trouble over, and on comes another. The slave's life is full of uncertainty. I had returned to Baltimore but a short time when the tidings reached me that my kind friend, Mrs. Lucretia, who was only second in my regard to Mrs. Hewald, was dead, leaving her husband and only one child, a daughter named Amanda. Shortly after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, strange to say, Master Andrew died, leaving his wife and one child. Thus the whole family of Anthony's was swept away. Only two children remained. All this happened within five years of my leaving Colonel Lloyd's. No alteration took place in the condition of the slaves in consequence of these deaths, yet I could not help feeling less secure after the death of my friend, Mrs. Lucretia, than I had done during her life. While she lived, I felt that I had a strong friend to plead for me in any emergency. Ten years ago, while speaking of the state of things in our family, after the events just named, I used this language. Quote, now all the property of my old master, slaves included, was in the hands of strangers. Strangers who had nothing to do in accumulating it. Not a slave was left free. All remained slaves, from the youngest to the oldest. If any one thing in my experience more than another served to deepen my conviction of the infernal character of slavery and to fill me with unutterable loathing of slaveholders, it was their base ingratitude to my poor old grandmother. She had served my old master faithfully from youth to old age. She had been the source of all his wealth. She had peopled his plantation with slaves. She had become a great-grandmother in his service. She had rocked him in infancy, 
attended him in childhood, served him through life, and at his death wiped from his icy brow the cold death sweat and closed his eyes forever. She was nevertheless left a slave, a slave for life, a slave in the hands of strangers, and in their hands she saw her children, her grandchildren, and her great-grandchildren divided like so many sheep, without being gratified with the small privilege of a single word as to their or her own destiny. And to cap the climax of their base ingratitude and fiendish barbarity, my grandmother, who was now very old, having outlived my old master and all his children, having seen the beginning and end of all of them, and her present owners finding she was of but little value, her frame already racked with the pains of old age, and complete helplessness fast stealing over her once active limbs, they took her to the woods, built her a little hut, put up a little mud chimney, and then made her welcome to the privilege of supporting herself there in perfect loneliness, thus virtually turning her out to die. If my poor old grandmother now lives, she lives to suffer in utter loneliness, she lives to remember and mourn over the loss of children, the loss of grandchildren, and the loss of great-grandchildren. They are, in the language of the slave's poet, Whittier, Gone, gone, sold and gone, to the rice swamp dank and lone, where the slave whip ceaseless swings, where the noisome insect stings, where the fever demon strews, poison with the falling dews, where the sickly sunbeams glare through the hot and misty air, gone, gone, sold and gone, to the rice swamp dank and lone, from Virginia hills and waters, woe is me, my stolen daughters. The hearth is desolate, the children, the unconscious children who once sang and danced in her presence, are gone. She gropes her way in the darkness of age for a drink of water, Instead of the voices of her children, she hears by day the moans of the dove and by nights the screams of the hideous owl. All is gloom, the grave is at the door. And now, when weighed down by the pains and aches of old age, when the head inclines to the feet, when the beginning and ending of human existence meet and helpless infancy and painful old age combine together, at this time, this most needful time, the time for the exercise of that tenderness and affection which children only can exercise toward a declining parent, my poor old grandmother, the devoted mother of twelve children, is left all alone in yonder little hut before a few dim embers. End quote. Two years after the death of Mrs. Lucretia, Master Thomas married his second wife, her name was Rowena Hamilton, the eldest daughter of Mr. William Hamilton, a rich slaveholder on the eastern shore of Maryland, who lived about five miles from St. Michael's, the then place of my master's residence. Not long after his marriage, Master Thomas had a misunderstanding with Master Hugh, and as a means of punishing his brother, he ordered him to send me home. As the ground of misunderstanding will serve to illustrate the character of Southern chivalry and humanity, I will relate it. Among the children of my aunt Millie was a daughter named Henny. When quite a child, Henny had fallen into the fire and had burnt her hands so bad that they were of very little use to her. Her fingers were drawn almost into the palms of her hands. She could make out to do something, but she was considered hardly worth the having, of little more value than a horse with a broken leg. This unprofitable piece of human property, ill-shapen and disfigured, Captain Ald sent off to Baltimore, making his brother Hugh welcome to her services. After giving poor Henny a fair trial, Master Hugh and his wife came to the conclusion that they had no use for the crippled servant, and they sent her back to Master Thomas. This the latter took as an act of ingratitude on the part of his brother, and as a mark of his displeasure, he required him to send me immediately to St. Michael's, saying, 
if he cannot keep hen, he shall not have Fred. Here was another shock to my nerves, another breaking up of my plans, and another severance of my religious and social alliances. I was now a big boy. I had become quite useful to several young colored men who had made me their teacher. I had taught some of them to read and was accustomed to spend many of my leisure hours with them. Our attachment was strong, and I greatly dreaded the separation. But regrets, especially in a slave, are unavailing. I was only a slave. My wishes were nothing, and my happiness was the sport of my masters. My regrets at now leaving Baltimore were not for the same reasons as when I before left that city to be valued and handed over to my proper owner. My home was not now the pleasant place it had formerly been. A change had taken place, both in Master Hugh and in his once pious and affectionate wife. The influence of brandy and bad company on him, and the influence of slavery and social isolation upon her, had wrought disastrously upon the characters of both. Thomas was no longer little Tommy, but was a big boy, and had learned to assume the airs of his class toward me. My condition, therefore, in the house of Master Hugh, was not by any means so comfortable as in former years. My attachments were now outside of our family. They were felt to those whom I imparted instruction, and to those little white boys from whom I received instruction. There, too, was my dear old father, the pious Lawson, who was, in Christian graces, the very counterpart of Uncle Tom. The resemblance is so perfect that he might have been the original of Mrs. Stowe's Christian hero. The thought of leaving these dear friends greatly troubled me, for I was going without the hope of ever returning to Baltimore again, the feud between Master Hugh and his brother being bitter and irreconcilable, or at least supposed to be so. In addition to thoughts of friends from whom I was parting, as I supposed, forever, I had the grief of neglected chances of escape to brood over. I had put off running away until now I was to be placed where the opportunities for escaping were much fewer than in a large city like Baltimore. On my way from Baltimore to St. Michael's, down the Chesapeake Bay, our sloop, the Amanda, was passed by the steamers plying between that city and Philadelphia, and I watched the course of those steamers, and, while going to St. Michael's, I formed a plan to escape from slavery, of which plan and matters connected therewith the kind reader shall learn more hereafter.